שלום עליכם, תקיים לי? ברוך השם. Okay, with great stat of the Shmaya, we are in the second parak of Pirkei Avas, starting the third Mishnah. And we are still within the statements of Rabban Gamliel. So Rabban Gamliel continues and he says, Havu zihirin barashut. You should be very careful with rashut. See what rashut means. She'ein makarvim lo la'adam ela letzorach atzman. Because they only draw close to a man for their own need, for their own uh, purpose. Nirin koavin b'shatan atan. They appear as if they love you at the time when they benefit from it. Ve'ein omdim lo la'adam b'shat dochakom. But they don't stand by your side at the time when you are pressed, when you're in trouble. So at surface value, then it sounds like this Mishnah is a particularly pessimistic Mishnah. That whatever Rishut is referring to, then they're hypocrites. In Hebrew, you would call them tzivu'im. They're people who act in one way. Echad b'peh echad b'leif. They act in one way in the way they speak and a different way in the way that they uh, act. They think about you in one way, but they speak in another way. They, they draw you close when they have a benefit from it. They act as if they love you when they, when they stand to have pleasure. However, when you need them, when they're not benefiting, but you need them, they're not there to help you out. They're not there to stand by your side and benefit you. So what is this Rashut referring to? That sounds like such a negative interaction that we are to have. So question number one, what is Rashut referring to? And that we're going to answer in two different ways. Another question is, and this is the Maharal's question, is that Rabban Gamliel was the author of the last Mishnah. And if you look at the next Mishnah, it's still speaking in the name of Rabban Gamliel, but there it says, Hu haya omer. Now, Hu haya omer means we're starting a new phrase, a new statement. Still Rabban Gamliel, but a new concept. Whereas this Mishnah doesn't say Hu haya omer, meaning that the author of the Mishnahis put the Mishnahis in a way that he understood that this was a continuation of the previous concept. And that's why he didn't start this Mishnah with Hu haya omer, because it's the same concept. So we have to understand what the connection here between Mishnah Gimel and Mishnah basis, how is it an extension? So most of the Mephoshim explain that the word Rishut is referring to um, a government, people who run the society, people who are in control. And if so, it's a very, very broad generalization. You should be careful of Rishut because all governments and all societies in all times only come close to a man where they have benefit from it and they look like they love you, but they're only doing it for themselves, and they don't stand for you the time they benefit. But if he was just referring to the Romans in the era that this was said, is said in, then it could very well be that that was a true lesson for he teaching how to relate to the Roman Empire at that time. But our understanding of Mishnayas is that it's messages that are supposed to be relevant for every era and for every generation. And if that's the case, then it's a very broad generalization, a very pessimistic outlook which is hard for us to understand what the message is. I mean, it's just saying, be very careful. Don't get close to anyone because they're, out. they're not going to help you when you need. Thank you for the warning. It doesn't need to be in Pirka Avos. It's not necessarily Torah. If you're just telling me, be careful of people who are hypocrites, then that's not necessarily a Torah concept that you need to teach in Pirka Avos for all, for all time. And also the language of Zahirim. The word Zahir implies there's a big danger that's about to be taught. You have to be careful because there's something very dangerous coming up. And then what does it teach you? It teaches that there are people who are hypocrites. So that's something which is a, a well-known concept. There are people who are, but it's not dangerous. And it could be dangerous. Maybe you'll trust in them and they'll, they'll backfire. But what is that word Zahir coming to teach, which, is, which justifies the need for the word Zahir? One last question on this concept is that if it is referring to uh, the government, then we see other places, another place in Pirkei Later on, that it says you should daven for the malchus, and not just because you want to have shalom, but even because there's a need to daven for them, because without having a malchus, without having a government running the country, then ish chaimit reihu balau, then people would eat each other alive, meaning having a government is a very positive thing. In fact, the Rabbeinu Yonah here, he says, the pshat of this Mishnah is that you should never trust the government, and they're a terrible thing, and they're only out for themselves. And he says, Khalila the Khalila. That's what that's his language. He says even harsh than that. Khalila the Khalila lo yev lo yakum. 
So either it's that there were people who were uh, editing it and he was scared of what they were going to read and therefore he had to write things that, no, I know the government's going to read this. Or he meant it and he was saying it authentically. The Khalil of Khalil, I mean, the Pshat of the Mishnah seems to be very against what later on in Pirik Yavas, we're instructed that we should uh, daven for the government and appre- at least appreciate, at least appreciate the government. I can say on a personal level, I grew up in a foreign country. I didn't grow up in Eretz Israel. And although I don't necessarily align myself today with the va- all the values that, that society lives, I still have a lot to thank that country for providing me for a, a, an environment and an education and, and some values which I still today hold very preciously. And although I, I wouldn't want to raise my children in that country because I think the values of that country go against the values of Torah in a major way, if not in an open way, but in a subtle way, but nevertheless, I think I gained a lot from being there and I don't think the government was out to get me and they were trying to harm me. And, and that's true in America today. And I think it's true in Israel today that no, none of these governments that any of us here live in are evil governments who are just pretending as if they care about us and they really only care about themselves. And therefore, going back to our initial question, of what does it mean on a deeper level? A message that's eternal. So I'm going to take one totally off the chart, Perush, which I like the message very much. Although it's unique, it's not that which most of the Rishonim write, uh, but I think the message is very true. And then we're going to get back to the message of the majority of the Rishonim and try and have a deeper understanding of how to understand it. So the Medrash Shmuel is a commentary that many of the uh, Achronim uh, quotes. Uh, he himself brings even earlier sources. And he writes the following shot. He says, nowhere here does it say it's talking about a government. It says the word Rishut. And what is Rashut referring to? So anyone who's learned that famous Ramban at the beginning of Parshas Kedoshim knows that there are areas which are mitzvahs, there are areas which are averas, and there are areas which are Rashut. And Rashut is things which are permissible, and they include pleasures of the world. It could be food, it could be having relations, anything. It could be outings and enjoyments and pleasure and entertainment. All those things are in the category of Rashut. Now, what should our attitude towards Rashut be? How should we relate to the physical pleasures of the world? Now, to understand this point deeply, let's just take a step back. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created every man with a neshama. Our neshama desires connection with Hashem. The connection with Hashem is sweet. It's something which gives pleasure. Like the opening of Mr. Hashem says, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created us for pleasure, and the ultimate pleasure is the connection to Him. So every man deeply is desiring pleasure. But that pleasure could come out in the way that it was intended, which is in a spiritual way, through learning of Torah, through connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that would be the highest form of that pleasure. But it could also be channeled through the body. So that the, the, the pure desire of pleasure, way back in the upper worlds, by the time it's expressed in this world, is about having Cheerios, and about having Snickers bars, and about having all sorts of physical things which although it emanates from a very pure source, but in this world, since it's being channeled through the body and we're not hearing it in its original form, we're only hearing it through its filtered down version of the body, then it's, it's the desire for pleasure, the desire for sweetness, channeled in an unhealthy way. And that's the way the Midrash Shmuel reads this Mishnah. It's a beautiful read. Havu zehirin barashut. You should be very careful when it comes to areas that are permissible areas. We'll give the simple example of eating food, sweet food, but you could take this to many other areas as well. You should be very careful, why? Because they don't provide the end goal of bringing you close to Hashem. They only provide the end goal, they only are close to you, they only, in order to have their own pleasures fulfilled. Meaning, when you finish eating the shawarma, then that was the end goal. There's nothing more that goes beyond that. They are only their tzorech atzman. They only have benefit in what they are. Meaning, the benefit of pleasure in Hashem is an eternal benefit that raises your level in Avodat Hashem, raises your neshama, brings you close to your purpose. However, when you get involved in physical pleasures, although it emanated from a pure source, but it's only the tzorech atzman. It's only for the sake of that pleasure. When that pleasure is finished, it's finished. Sometimes it's so harsh that you finish the pleasure and you feel even repulsed by it when you overeat very sweet ice cream. So then it, like, it, it was pleasurable initially, but then what, it's not even finished yet and you're already feeling sick of it because it only lasts that moment. 
Beshat Hana'atan, it looks like it's something that you love and it loves you. You're in love with each other, eating this food and benefiting from it. At the moment that you're enjoying it, at the moment you're enjoying it, then it's very pleasurable and it's very enjoyable. However, it's not something that's going to last for you in a way that's going to raise you, build you. So when you have a Yetzirah and you want to overcome it, that's not going to help you in any way. It's not going to help you overcome the negative parts within you. When you connect to the pleasure of coming close to Hashem, then that elevation that you have of being close to Hashem raises your nobility that you will, will see all base things as beneath you, Averas will be below you, and you won't want to do that. Meaning if you answer the true pleasure of coming in pleasure with Avodet Hashem, you won't think of speaking Roshan Hara, you won't think of eating things that are trade. Of course not. You're a noble individual. Why would you do that? You won't think of insulting someone because you're someone who learns Torah and davens to Hashem. So when you have the real pleasure expressed from coming close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it will even help you Bishat Dochako. It will even help you at a time when you're in trouble, when you have a Yetzirah. However, if you just get the pleasure of the physical world expressed by eating food or any other physical pleasures, that's not going to help you in any way. In fact, it's probably going to push you further away. It's not going to help you. So that's a shot that reads in beautifully. It reads into the words beautifully. It's not what the Rishonim say, but the Major Shmuel was a Baal Gavra. He, he says a shot which I think stands independently and can answer many of our questions. So therefore, the Major Shmuel's answer is answer number one. It doesn't answer the question of how it's connected really to the last piece. And that's why we're going to bring in the Maharal. And this Maharal is also going to need an introduction. It's going to be similar to what we spoke about yesterday, but to some degree the flip side of it. And it's going to have a much deeper understanding, which will give us the ability to understand what the other Rishonim are saying when they speak about it referring to a government. So let me take a step back. In this world, there is a need for Malchus. So like we said the last question, how later on we daven for Malchus. What is that need for Malchus? What would happen if we wouldn't have Malchus? Let's explain this concept deeply. Every individual, as well as pleasure, like we just spoke about in the Medrash Shmuel, also feels a sense of lack. And is looking outside of himself to fill that lack. Now, if I'm lacking in area A, and someone else is lacking in area B, then I may want to fill what I need and I may trample on him and crush him. Because when every individual is trying to fulfill their own personal desires and their own personal needs and what they're lacking in, then it, it may not benefit someone else. It may harm someone else. When you have a system which incorporates all the people and enables everyone's needs to be expressed in it, then instead of it being, I have a need, and he has a need, and she has a need, and they have a need, and we're all just fighting for ourselves in a doggy dog world, rather everyone's part of one bigger system, then we can all say, well, how are we going to work together in a unified manner to have our needs expressed? Let me give a very simple example. Imagine you would have a group of 20 men, each of which recognize they have an inner desire to fulfill in life. They have a mission. They feel they have a sense of drive in a certain area, but they don't have a way of expressing it or how to fulfill it. So they form a pact, a bond. They form it. They make a group. And they say, within our group, we're all going to help each other for free, not for any money, but just we're part of this group who helps each other. Now, everyone write down now, please. What desire do you have to be fulfilled? What strengths do you have? What particular purpose do you have in the world that you can contribute or that you need? And they all write it down. And one central person, the secretary of the group, he writes it all down and he sees, you know, this person has a deep need for, uh, for he's lonely. And this person has a great desire. His need is to be able to help other people. And he pairs them up and they're able to help one another. No money involved. Just each person, their need is being expressed by helping one another. And this person has a, there's no husband in the family. It's just a lot of children and a single mother. And this girl is really bored and she just spends afternoons wasting her time with no way. She pairs those two up. You can come and help babysit for them. No money, just you have a need to fulfill your time in a meaningful way. You have a need, lots of children at home and no one to really take care of them. Here we go, we'll pair them up. This person never had children. This person's father passed away. We'll make a big brother system. And you see lots of people have needs. But without a system, they wouldn't be able to fulfill their needs. They probably would harm other people in the way. But once you have a central force that's able to pull everyone together and say, well, within our system, 
all these needs can be fulfilled in a way that's a mutual fulfillment of a desire. It's not your need and your need and your need. It's the system's need. We're all working in one unit. And that's the goal of what a system provides. That's what a government can provide. They say, we'll sponsor you to do a degree in this area because our, our society needs this and you want to have a degree and earn money, so we need you here. And it puts everyone together and, every, and the society is able to function in a higher way. And therefore, it's a great benefit that we have as a society. Now, having described all that, it sounds beautiful. Why, why is our mission so against it? Where does it go wrong? But there's an ideal and there's a false. And the danger in our Mishnah is when instead of the ideal being fulfilled, there's a false one that comes and replaces it. And that false one, the danger here, is that we will replace the true ideal with a false model. And that's what we're coming to describe now in this Mishnah. Let me just give you an image here. Imagine I draw a big circle over here. See it? There's a big circle. And there's a point right in the middle. Now, there's a, there's a point at the extreme of the circle over here, and there's a point at the ceiling circle over here, which couldn't be further away from each other. But they're equal distance from the middle point. At the same time, there's two points here, one right next to each other, and they're also equal to the middle point. I mean, the middle point in a circle holds everything together, even if you have people who, from one another, are extremes apart. But since they're both focused on that central point, then they're able to work towards a central point and towards a higher goal, a greater good. And each one is coming from who he is. We're not trying to make everyone the same here. Everyone is who he is. They all have their own unique needs and desires, but they're able to work together in a system to fulfill the ultimate central purpose. Now, what is that central point? And this is the big point that we need to discuss. What is that central point that's holding the whole circle together around which everything focuses. So let's discuss the ideal first. David HaMelech was the ideal Malchus that ever existed. Because David HaMelech, he took no credit for himself at all. He recognized that he was just the conduit through which to bring Malchut Hashem. So when all the people of the world were under his jurisdiction and they were all finding a way to fulfill their need and he was making the whole society work everybody knew that, that central point was HaKadosh Baruch Hu. and they were all coming to meet HaKadosh Baruch Hu. they were all coming to see how they could fulfill the will of Hashem each from their unique angle each from their unique point like we discussed yesterday with the Shlichei Chabad they all have their unique ways of doing it but they all recognize they're serving the same God and they're sent on a shlichut by the same message. So the Maharal says that the, the last Mishnah was a description of the ideal Malchut. The way that a society could be run in the best possible way. Where the leader of the society doesn't take any credit for himself. In a sense, he doesn't even exist. All he is, is enabling, facilitating everyone to fulfill their mission in serving Hashem and pulling them all together in one society where they all recognize, I'm a shaliyah of Hashem. He makes one central point, which in those times was the Beis HaMikdash, one central point from which emanates, everyone recognizes they have a role as part of something greater. They're serving Hashem in their unique way, and that's the ultimate model of Malchus. Central point, circle all around, but we know what the central point is. It's serving Hashem. That was yesterday's mission. Today's Mishnah comes to show the flip side. What happens when, now here's the key word, people take Rashut for themselves. The word Rashut is where you determine that you are in charge. And this is how our societies work today. Now, it's not a problem inherently, meaning it, it's not a bad thing in the sense that they're evil. It's not a bad thing that the, that the people here are wicked and doing bad things. It could end up being that way like Stalin or Hitler, it could end up being that way. But it's not necess necessarily it's an evil model, but it's just the model is built in a way that there's no source. There's no primary point from which it emanates from. In Torah, we have a central point from which everything emanates from, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's a malchut which is built in. It's, it's intrinsic. It's inherent. 
because we are actually all connected to Hashem. That's the way we're designed. It's not that we're making up a central point, that we're make, pretending there's a system or a model which everyone has to fit into, which doesn't really exist. No, it really is true and exists. HaKadosh Baruch Hu really is that central point. And we really are equidistant from Him. And we really all do connect to Him. And therefore, when David HaMelech comes in and he's mavatel himself to the tzibur, he's one of the tzibur. Moshe Rabbeinu cancels himself to the tzibur. He only exists in the merit of the tzibur. It's because they're representing a true model. They're not making up rules. They're not making up laws. They're not making up the society. They're just reflecting a true version of what the society is. Every other model is inherently flawed, not because anyone's doing anything wrong. It could be that all the people in the society intend to do good. They all really want to help. But where did they get their rules from? They made them up. In, in Israel today, where do the rules come from? They're based on British rule and Turkish rule that existed in Palestine before Israel was formed, together with some reforms that came along the way in order to fit into Jewish. You would have thought that when the state would be founded 72, three years ago, then the judges who were founded, the lawmakers, would be running to the Dayanim. They would be running to the chief rabbi. And they would be saying, finally, we are an independent nation, our own land. We don't need to look to the Turkish or to the British to determine how our law is going to be run. Let us look back to what our authentic nation's law is. The law of God. And that would be the ideal of how the society would then be run. But they were so stuck in the mindset of there's a law and order and the British were pretty good at doing law and order. So let's just keep up what they were saying. They got stuck with that. Just by the way, totally in brackets, but very amusing. There was someone who smuggled in via Egypt a lot of goods at the beginning of the state. And when they, when they caught him, and he said, uh, he said, I'll go to court. And they went to court and they said, you're not allowed to smuggle in. And he says, yes, I am. It says in the rule books that I'm allowed to. And they go, it can't be. So they went to look at the laws and it said there, you are not allowed to bring it without taxes, either by ship or by, uh, or by plane. And he says, I didn't bring it in by ship. I didn't bring it in by plane. I brought it in by land. And they looked at the law and they said, that's funny. Why does it say that? Why does it say you can't bring it in by ship or bring it in by plane? But it doesn't say by land because they copied the law from the British. And Britain is an island. And there's no way of bringing in Britain by land. So they just copy, paste the laws of the British. And this guy got to bring it. They obviously changed the law immediately afterwards. But you see the foolishness, the foolishness of trying to make a system of law which is based on man-made laws. It's only as great as you, the society of people who make it up. So have a zahirin bereshut, according to the Maharal, means something else entirely. By definition, any law that comes by rishus, that meaning people choose it, they give permission for it, they made it up, it's taking you away from the primary, authentic, intrinsic, inherent model of what Malchus Hashem is. There is a concept of Malchus in the world, and the Melech is absolutely cancelled to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the central point is Hashem because he's of truly the central point. And that's the authentic model of Malchus. However, when you're talking about Rishus, it's inherently flawed. Even if the people are the best, kindest people, and they intend to do the best good, it's only emanating from them. And therefore, have Zahir. So this is so point number one, how does this connect to the last section? It connects to the last section because it's the flip side of where Malchus goes wrong. Question number two, what does the word Rishus mean? We're being loyal, not like the Medrash Shmuel who gave a beautiful Peshat. And we'll stay, we'll hold that one dear in our hearts. But now we're going back to the Rishonim and we're having a, 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 a parish where Rishus means, Rishus means government. But now we're understanding why is it called Rishus? Because they took Rishus for themselves. They're the ones who made it up. Now we're understanding why you have to be Zahir. You have to be Zahir, not because of what they're doing. They may be good people. It could be that America, England, and Israel all have wonderful laws that serve us very well. But the very model you have to be careful of. Because the very model, when you see that model as a good model, law and order in the world, then it, you should pray for it to continue because it is benefiting us in, in a lower way. That at least everyone's getting away to function in society in a beneficial way. But it's taking away from the ultimate purpose of recognizing that Kodesh Baruch was the ultimate Malchut Shemaim, who being the true center, the authentic center. 
שאין מקרבים לו לאדם, אלא לצורך עצמן. So now, what does it mean לצורך עצמן? They make up the rules according to what suits them. Because they don't have any objective source, they don't have any way that they're connected to something higher, that they know their laws are benefiting the world on all levels. Like, it could be like the people in Palestine who just transfer British laws and they're harming the people. They're just doing it לצורך עצמן. נירים כאוהבים בשעת הנעתם, and therefore any society always has presumption that they think this is what's good for people, this is what benefits people, and they'll always look to you as if they're loving you and doing it for you for their benefit. So let's say, for example, if you have a society who holds dear the value of same-sex marriages, then they will come and say, this is something that we feel will benefit the people. This is what's going to give goodness to the people. Now, if you would ask that same question 50 years ago, it would be abhorred. It would be absurd. They would think it's disgusting. But because they don't have any authentic source, there's no objective source they can hold on to. So then in, in any era, any craziness can come your way and it will be adopted as normative and they'll change the laws and change the rules. And therefore, you have to be very careful. Only if you're rooted in truth, in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's objective truth, then can you rely on the law and order. If it's not truth, then it may be that right now it looks beneficial to you and you're happy, but when you're in trouble and they've decided to make a new way of system because their, their mindset, their hashkafa, if you like, the, 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 the concepts that exist behind the scenes, which are what determining the laws to be made, won't stand up for you at the time they need because they're not true. They're not objective. They're not coming from a higher source. So they may benefit you from time to time and you may be very happy and grateful and you should thank them and thank and be grateful to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that they're good shlichim in the times they are. But always remember that any good that they do is not coming from an objective truth. I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, but I'll just quote to you, Baal There's a Gemara in Horaeus. Please look it up if you have a chance to. There's a Gemara in Horaeus, Taf Yud, which is the same Rabban Gamliel that we're quoting now. The same Rabban Gamliel he says there's an amazing statement, which is the kind of crux of this idea. Harai Staf Yud. Rabbi Gamliel was looking for who would be, sorry, Rabbi Gamliel had two Talmidim who were very great Talmud Chachamim, but also very poor. And he wanted to give them a role in the community in order that they would have Parnassah. So he sent for them to be leaders of the communities, and both of them didn't respond. And then he sent for them a second time, and only then they responded. And he said to them when they came, I know why you didn't come the first time. Because you're concerned to take a role of responsibility. You're concerned for Sarah to be a leader. He said, but understand me well. The role that I have given you is not a role of Sarah. It's not a role of you elevating yourselves upon other people. It's a role of Avdus. It's a role of being an Eved. And that crystallizes the idea of what Rabbi Gamliel is saying here in this Mishnah. The previous Mishnah is the true reflection of what a leader is. A leader is someone who doesn't see himself as putting his own opinion on others. I am the leader now. I can choose to do things the way I want to. No, you're getting in the way of Hashem. Hashem is shining his light. Your role is to be an Eved. Your role is only to be a conduit in thinking, what would Hashem want to happen? Based on Das Torah, check in with the Gedolim. Based on Das Torah, what needs to be done? And I will just enable that. I will facilitate that. Anyone listening now who will find themselves in any position of leadership, whether it's on a high level, like you're managing a school or a community, or whether it's on a primary level, like you're running your own family, recognize that your role is not to be a leader in the sense of, I get to decide how things go here. Because then you'll be a Rishus, where you're taking Rishus for yourself, and you're deciding how things should go. What are you basing it on? whatever comes your way at the whim, whatever you feel like because you had a negative interaction with that guy over there and now you're going to take it out on your family or a community, chas v'chalila. Rather, Rabbi Gamliel said, don't be a srara. Don't be that you're leading yourself over the people in the way that you're in control. That was never the position I was giving you. Avdut aninotein lachim. I'm giving you the opportunity to be an evid. When an evid is someone who doesn't have his own form, like Moshe Rabbein, who is an evid Hashem, the ultimate evid Hashem, all and evidence is receiving instruction for his master and carrying out. And that's what this mission was, the flip side of the ultimate goal. And that's Rabbi Gamliel's expression of it as he instructed his Talmudim. Yeshar Koach, have a good night.